Welcome back into the original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, with my co-host, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. The producer extraordinaire, uh, Benito Agosta. And we are coming at you on Zoom today. You also have an audio recording of this that will drop uh, on uh, all the podcast platforms. But uh, this is a video and audio special with a very, very special guest, uh, Matthew Gentile, a hot, hot, up-and-coming writer-director in Hollywood that uh, really embraces the true crime genre and has his first major feature coming out soon based on an incredible true story uh, of Jason Derrick Brown, who for well over a decade was on America's 10 most wanted list, uh, con man, murderer, just a uh, great film. We recommend it. And we're going to bring Matthew in right now to discuss it. Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. And that was quite an intro. So I'll do my yeah, best well, to live up to it. The movie's called American Murder, and uh, it is in theaters as we speak. Um, it will be on uh, video on demand pretty soon. On Friday. Yeah, so Friday, October 28th, you can rent it on the iTunes store, Amazon, Voodoo, Cable, DirecTV, anywhere you uh, can rent a film uh, on digital, you can rent American Murder. So if you can't make it to a theater, uh, please rent it there. If you can make it to a theater, we highly recommend that because it's a great uh, big screen movie. But whatever, uh, whatever you can do, as long as you get to see it, that's what matters. I mean, I think the story uh, itself is obviously so ripe for for a movie adaptation, but it's also a hidden gem, I think, in in the world of of true crime. I didn't know about Jason uh, until you <laughs> approached me, or when we when we hooked up, and uh, and uh, it, it's really a uh, a diamond in the rough of a true crime tale, and it's pretty pretty recent. Uh, most of the stuff was was happening in the, in the 2000s, uh, late 90s, early uh, early 2000s, and yeah. out yeah. Uh, out in the West Coast, Pacific Northwest. So why don't you tell us, uh, and then Jimmy, you can chime in whenever you feel necessary. But Matthew, why don't you just tell us, you know, where you how you came up about this story, and uh, how you you went about finding a way to to bring it to the big screen. And we should say that uh, the movie stars Tom Pelfrey of Ozark. Uh, Ryan Philippi, who's been around forever and uh, is just one of those really uh, staples of American cinema the last two, three decades. Uh, Dina Menzel, uh, a Broadway all-time great. Jackie Weaver, Oscar nominee. You, you, you got a pretty stacked cast. Kevin Corrigan is in it, who's one yes. of my favorite like character actors. Oh, he's That's great. been in a lot of Scorsese uh, films, a lot of Spike Lee movies. Yes, he has. Um, yeah, so I'll start with what drew me to it. Um, so before I wanted to be a filmmaker, um, you know, I wanted to be an FBI agent. And, you know, I got to say, um, you know, Jimmy, I see your wall behind you and the movies that are behind Jimmy right now, Scarface, Sopranos, I see Godfather, yep, Dog Day Afternoon, right? Uh, these are the kinds of movies that made me want to be a filmmaker. My father showed me uh, Dog Day Afternoon when I was 12 with Al Pacino. Um, and it quickly became my favorite film of all time. I just uh, was obsessed with the story. I really related to the character. And I just felt that, you know, even though this guy robbed a bank and was putting a gun in people's faces, I felt bad for him at the end when he got caught. So, you know, this was the kind of, you know, when I saw this movie at age 12, um, you know, I grew up in, a, I'm an Italian Jew from New York. So, uh, you know, when I used to go around my mom and, and dad, they used to take me to the theater a lot, me and my siblings, we'd go. And when you walk the streets of New York, they used to sell screenplays on street stands, uh, like little vendors. They used to print out scripts and sell them with like a little image from the movies, basically like a bootleg script that they probably had no right to sell. But my mom saw me eyeing a, a, a street stand that had copies of films like Dog Day Afternoon, Goodfellas, and, uh, Dog, and uh, many others, and The Godfather. So my mom saw me eyeing the, the copy of Dog Day Afternoon. She bought it for me. I took it home, 12 years old, read the screenplay, had the movie on VHS, watched it, read it, and said to myself, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to be Frank Pierce. I want to write the script for, this, for, for a movie like this. So 
age 14, I used to, I, like I said, I wanted to be an FBI agent. So I basically wanted to be Ryan Phillippe's character in this movie. And, um, you know, I used to go on the FBI.gov website and look at the top 10 fugitives. And I, I would do this with the hope of helping the FBI catch one, right? And get the reward money and use it to do whatever. So uh, I would go on, I would peruse the, the fugitive site. And at this time, Jason Derrick Brown's headshot was on uh, the FBI's most wanted fugitive site because he committed the crime in 04 um, that made him become a top 10 fugitive. And uh, I was around 14. And I remembered being struck by his face. And the reason his face really stood out was because when you look at the FBI top 10 fugitives, especially at that time, you had really a lot of mean, menacing, sophisticated criminals up there like Whitey Bulger, Osama bin Laden, you know, guys who really didn't look like Jason Derrick Brown. Jason really clearly stood out. There's a certain. He looks like, dude, he looks like Spicoli. He, exactly. He looks so <laughs> much like Spicoli. He's been. You want to think funny, you're going to love Sean Penn's body double has been arrested twice in the 18 years. Yeah, I read, I read that when I was researching this. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's just the face immediately stood out, not the crime, not anything, like that, but just his face. And I remember the mugshot. It was like imprinted on me. So cut to 14 years later. I'm going to jump back around in time a lot. You've seen my movie. So, you know, I do that. <laughs> well, we do, <laughs> you listen to our podcast. I, like, I, have, I, have, I love it. I love this podcast. I, I I really use it as a res as a research tool, and I think for any crime writer out there, any crime creator, content creator should listen to this podcast. So there's there's my endorsement for you guys. Um, unpaid sponsorship, <laughs> which this is too. But um, you know, yeah. So, anyways, I was really um, you know, I, I had not thought about it for about over a decade. You know, cut to 14 years later, I'm graduated film school at AFI. I'm trying to figure out what my first movie is. And, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, I, I think a lot of us filmmakers and certainly writers, like we kind of write the stuff we grew up loving in a weird way. Like, you know, you kind of the movies you loved at age 12, 13, 14 are kind of I feel like the films you go out and try to make more or less or the, maybe the books you try to write. And so for me, um, I was struggling to figure out what my first movie was. I had options. You know, I had a couple short films that were doing well, getting seen around the industry. But, you know, in Hollywood, whenever you have a small measure of success, all anyone asks you is, what do you got next? What do you got next? And I didn't quite have that first movie lined up. So I was doing a lot of, you know, gigs. I was shooting commercials for people and such. One day I was storyboarding a, a shoot. And as I'm storyboarding, I have the TV on in the background and, um, you know, just drawing on my images and, and and American Greed pops up on my TV. I always have CNBC or something like that in the background. And American Greed comes on the TV and all of a sudden Jason's face flashes on my television. I see the full, the full mug shot. And I look at him and I go, what the fuck? I turn up the volume. I go, that guy is still missing. Because I knew in that time that Bin Laden had been apprehended, like Bulger had been apprehended, but not this man. What happened here? Something must have gone wrong. So I started doing my research. I started looking into the case and I started to, you know, and I, I turned up the volume on that documentary. And I saw that documentary was interesting, the American Greed one, because Jason's story has been covered everywhere. Dateline, American Greed, you know, multiple books, newspaper articles, right? There's a lot out there about him. And, you know, he also put his own image out there a lot. You know, kind of like a gangster. He was very much about flashy, being flashy, showing off his life. Show, you know, he filmed himself throwing a major boat party that we recreate in the film, right? With like girls. If, happen, if, if this story happens ten years into the future, this is on Instagram, and, right? And right. Twitter and Snapchat. Abs and Absolutely, that's the thing I've always said is that yeah, Jason was an influencer before the thing existed. You know, he was doing that. He was ahead of his time in that way. And um, so, yeah, so I just became absolutely fascinated. And what I realized was this was a fascinating story to me because here was this charismatic con man who was so good and convincing to so many different people that he actually managed to have this web of people who knew him, who loved him, who saw him through different perspectives completely. If you were to talk to Adina Menzel's character, who's a composite character, but if you were to talk to her, or you were to talk to his sister, you were to talk to his brother, which I didn't do by the way, but I got all these interviews with them and listened to them, I started to see that everyone had a different take on who this guy was and what he meant. And that was just really fascinating to me. The idea that this person, you know, wasn't so much about, I mean, the crime was interesting and fascinating for sure. The armored truck heist, you know, and I grew up loving movies like that, like Heat, you know, and and crime thrillers, you know, and crime drama. But we, 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 can, we can jump back, but I just want to throw in there for people uh, that are, you know, consuming this 
uh, you know, and they don't have any preconceived notions of who this guy is. It, it wasn't like this guy was a professional bank robber or uh, a stick-up artist. You know, he no. he made a big leap going from right. a con man to now I'm I'm going for I'm taking it to a whole other level of criminality. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and for a while, you know, Jason did petty cons and crimes and that escalated. But, you know, in, you know, really, you know, that's the fascinating thing about Jason's character is, you know, there's a lot of ways you can look at him, right? On one hand, you know, he he has elements, he has tendencies of a sociopath. On the other, you know, in his mind, he was desperate and thought he needed to do this to get back to a certain lifestyle that he wanted to have, right? And that's fucked up and crazy and bizarre and twisted. And the movie is t- is pretty twisted, you know, because we're really trying to show you the psychology of this morally very reprehensible guy, you know. And um, and those are the kinds of films I grew up loving, like the films that are on Jimmy Shell, you know, like I I love moral gray area. I love, you know, the, the films of the 70s, you know, and, and the film noirs of the 40s and 50s, you know. Um, those kinds of films that really explore that dark psychology. And that's what I think, you know, American Murder is is striving to do. Yeah, I, uh, something right away when I was watching it, I was texting with Scott, like as I was watching it in real time for the first time. And I, I it reminded me of of some movies like um, Catch Me If You Can or, or even or even American Psycho in the sense that um, you don't really like this guy. He's a despicable, a despicable person. But as Scott put it in our conversation, like you, you want to take this ride, though. You want to like you want to be on this ride with this guy, even though he's he's a really just a, a cringeworthy uh, sociopath and yeah. you're not rooting for him. Nevertheless, you want to you want to stay you're on cool, this ride cool and see riding, what happens. You're cool riding shotgun yeah. uh, on that road trip. And I, I think it's yeah. so it's so important uh, when you're making a film and, and you're you're talking about characters that are not black and white at all. There's a lot of gray in there. And uh, if you don't find a, you know, a, um, a lens in perspective with the right, you know, character plot points, the way that the characters are written and then the right actor to get, get you know hit those sweet spots you know i've been there could there could be great intentions and a great story and you can still miss the mark right. uh, i i lived it with my experience with white boy rick uh that film you know di- it didn't resonate with people uh and there was a great story there that just didn't translate from the the I guess from the page or the the real life uh, actions into people didn't want to ride with the characters in that film for whatever right. reason. So I just I think what Jimmy what we were right. saying is that whether it's a despicable character or the you know the the uh, a type of character that could be up for the Nobel Peace Prize, if you don't resonate with it, you're not going to want to be riding shotgun on that trip. Right. And, you know, you, you bring up a great point because this is the, you know, I think the common, you know, and I know you work in Hollywood too. So, you know, you, you, you deal with this in Hollywood. Where people, you better put that in, in quotations. <laughs> uh, me too. Me too, by the way, man. Me too. I'm, I'm, in, I'm independent, bro. <laughs> so I'm right there with you. Um, you know, no, but, you know, when you, you know, in the film industry or, or you know, studios, companies, financiers often, screenwriters complain that the notes they get back on their scripts are, oh, this character is not likable enough. You know, this character needs to be more likable or endearing or this and that. And, you know, the funny thing is, though, I mean, there is, it's not a completely, it's not completely a throwaway point, right? There are, there is some truth to that in that you have to be invested, right? As you said, you have to be able to at least ride shotgun, right? And what I can say about our movie, you know, American Murder is that, you know, correct, Jason is despicable and we don't really try to make him not that, you know, we're, we're, we're really showing you who he was, warts and all the whole way through. You're showing him not just, he's conning his own family. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, no, he'll still steal from his own mother. He does steal from Jackie Weaver, you know, it's like he, he will, he, there's nothing this guy won't do. And just when you think he might do something redeeming that he doesn't, you know, <laughs> but the thing about it though, that I think makes the movie you know, the movie, because early drafts of the screenplay, 
were just focused on Jason. You know, they were just in his point of view. I never went outside of it. And those drafts, while some of them are kind of interesting and cool as an experiment, they didn't really work because what made the story work, and I think what makes the movie work, is you see Jason Derrick Brown from all of these different perspectives. So you see him from the point of view of his sister, played by Chantel Van Sand, who I think does an amazing job. And she really shows you how he changes from this innocent boy who got swept over by his father and just played by Cameron Corrigan and just, you know, turned into this criminal. And then you see his mother, Jackie Weaver, who she sees right through his bullshit, right? And that's the con man's worst nightmare is the person who can see right through him. And then you have Adina Menzel who sees him as a romantic hero, right? And so we use each of these characters or Ryan's character sees him as, as a, you know, that's his prey. He's trying to hunt this guy. So you kind of are seeing it from all these different perspectives. And I think because of that constant shift and lens, like you talked about how it's like, now you're going to see him through this way. Now you're going to see, now we're going to be with him alone. Now we're going to see him through his brother, who's kind of like his surrogate father. You know, you're going to, you're going to get all these different perspectives of Jason so that by the end of the movie, whether you love him, hate him, fall anywhere in between, root for him, root against him, want him to get caught, want him to get away. I think you can enjoy the film because you get a 360 degree view of him and you get a fun ride, right? And you get confronted with, who was this guy? What was he about? Why? And the, you know, the movie, if anything, I don't really believe in messages because I think a lot of those movies on the shelf there and the movies we all love, I don't think they had messages. You know, I don't think Dog Day Afternoon said bank robbing's bad, right? I mean, it is, but I don't think that was what that movie was saying. Or I don't think The Godfather said, you know, oh, the mob's evil. Like we already knew that. <laughs> like, it's you know, about storytelling. <laughs> Telling a great yeah. story. Well, well the Godfather, a- yeah, the Godfather is about family. What does family mean? They, they pose questions, you know. And uh, the movie, the question behind American Murder for me was, why do we fall for con artists? Like, why does this keep happening? That we keep falling for their charm, we keep falling for their tricks, because it's very, and it's it's as prevalent. I mean, there's two great versions of the book Nightmare Alley, right? I love both movies equally. The '46 version, the new version, Del Toro, that I thought was very underrated, and. You know, those movies were, were made at different times, 2021 and, and 1946, but it's the same problem that they're talking about, which is that con artists have a way, especially, I mean, it's a, it's a worldwide thing, but it's especially, I think, prevalent in, in our culture. So I, that, that's what I was really trying to, you know, explore, con artists, gangsters, that kind of stuff. Well, I think the, uh, the lead actor does a great job of uh, being this like chameleon and, and yeah. in those different situations where you're talking about, I, I don't want to give too much away, but depending on who he's interacting with, he almost takes on a completely different personality. Uh, it, it's really remarkable. And I think that's what a con man, the, at least the, the ones who are, who are good at what they do um, are really able to mutate and transform. And so when, if he needs to be a kind of a yuppie party boy, he can do that. If he needs to be, um, endearing and like just a fun brother he can do that and even the scene where he's with the guy that he tries to um well i don't want to give too much away but he, he he's he's trying to uh, put together the, the bank heist and he, and he tries to recruit this guy and in that scene all of a sudden he's acting like kind of like he's like some urban thug gangster kind of dude and it was really yeah. fun to watch how depending on the situation he can transform and uh and as you point out that one of the great scenes is with the mom that never falls for it never and then and then he tries something else and then he's he's trying these different masks and she's the only one that is like nope Try again. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. It. And yeah, I think that's a con man's worst nightmare. But absolutely. I mean, Tom and I even talked about this. And I think he gives such an amazing performance because he really understood that part of Jason. He understood the charisma, he understood the physicality. He understood, you know, he had all of these things in, in spades. But I think, you know, what you're tapping on is completely correct. You know, he is like an actor. You know, he can pay he, every time he goes in somewhere, he's playing another role. And you're, I'm glad you picked up on that. Like, you know how yeah, when he visits Moises Ari's his character, he's a thug now. You know, and he's talking like when he's like it's like he listened to it's like he just watched Eight Mile and decided to talk like that. You know, and, and like we even talked about that, I think, in one of my descriptions that yeah, it's just like he's always constantly shape-shifting to fit who he's with. So he can give them whatever they need. You know, with the Dina's character, he's like nice suburban man, you know, <laughs> with his brother, he's golf boy. You know, it's like he's always changing. And I think that's what makes him so fascinating with such a fun character to you know, I think for Tom to play and for me as a writer and a director to really, you know, follow because he's always doing, he's always going to do something that will throw you off. And I think, you know, it's tough to figure him out. And I think that's what makes great engaging characters, you know, like 
whether like I've seen the Godfather now probably 300 times and I still can't figure out what makes Michael Corleone tick. You know, I'm like, you know, he's complex. You know, you watch that scene when he, you know, kills uh, Connie's brother or Connie's wa- uh, husband, you know, and I, I had a great argument with my drama teacher about that. And you're like, like, you know, we're, it's like, does he want to do it or does he do it? You know, and it's like, there's always this complex questions that these, these great movies, I think, do. They, they, they sit in your, they make these characters get under your skin and they stay in your head. And, you know, the fact that we're the, having that conversation about Michael Corleone 50 years right. after that film came out it speaks to what, how, why it's one of the all time great written characters. Yeah. I, I think the greatest film, well, the greatest American film ever made for sure for, for, for my money whatever my opinion's worth yeah i i, I think so and, and and i would say that with um the the main character he's not one-dimensional though in the sense of yeah yes he's despicable he's a con man but i'm i, I really was impressed with how again not trying to give too much away but the scenes with his siblings are the moments where you actually do see a little crack in, in the armor with him. He's still a piece of shit. Don't get me wrong. Even with, even with his siblings, but there is, I liked how you did that where you're like, people are comp- complicated. So even though he's a bad guy, he's a con man, he's always lying. Even a guy like that, are, he's going to have his soft spots. And, and, it, right. and it's clear in the film that it's with his siblings. And again, I don't want to overstate that. He takes advantage of them too. But you could just tell that if he does have a weak link, it, it's how he feels about his siblings. And, and, and I would just want curious, it was, is this just my reading of that? Or is, or is there something, something to No, that? not at all. I think that's completely true. I, I think that, you know, the one word theme of the movie, as I always saw it, was family. You know, and that this was a family sibling love story, actually, underneath. You know, we've carefully disguised it for you with the poster behind me, as you can see. A crime thriller, a cat and mouse chase, uh, a try, a hunt, an FBI agent and a criminal. It's got all those elements, you know, for sure. But underneath it all, at the core, this to me was a story about family. And, um, you know, even though Jason Derrick Brown is evil and does evil things throughout the course of the film and tests your ability to, to, to watch him, um, you know, at the end of the day, this was somebody who was loved by people. And I think he did love his siblings, even though he did horrible things to them, right? I think he did love Jamie. I think he did love Dave. And I think, by the way, all of his cons to a degree in his own brain had some truth to them. You know, otherwise, I don't think he would have been so convincing, you know? So I think that's also part of the interesting thing about a con man is it's like, it's always a question is, well, what was real? You know, was I get asked a lot in, in Q and A's and interviews. Well, well, did he love Adina's character? You know, did did he? People say, or did he just not care about? Her? Was he just using her? And the answer is, well, obviously he was using her, right? Because that's what it is. But at the same time, you know, I think, and Tom said this in, in another interview, I think a part of it had to be real to him. Otherwise, I don't think he could convince her of that because her character is not stupid. You know, the marks in this movie, the people who get used and taken advantage of, I think, are all for the most part, very intelligent people. Certainly, like, his sister was very strong and smart, I think. At least that's how I saw her character. The brother, you know, I think these are just, these people just, you know, got, unfortunately got caught up in this guy's web. And we talked about the movie some in some ways as a bit of a monster movie, you know. Um, this was a movie where, you know, anyone Jason comes into contact with is in danger, <laughs> you know, and so run, <laughs> right? But, you know, that's the question the movie's asking. is like, how do we deal with people like this? Because, sociopaths, con artists, people like that, they're, they're around, right? People who use people. And so that's what the movie's asking is, why do we fall for them? How do we deal with them? You know, what's the, what's the deal with that? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I was texting Scott when, again, in real time when, when we were watching it and my favorite scene in the movie is the golf course. Yeah. And I know, I know that's sort of, I get it's, it's an action film and, and I, I could easily pick, you know, any, you know, that might think you might, think people that have watched the film like well that not not a lot is happening but that's not the point i know it's an action film it's a it's a heist film crime film but to me that's the most powerful scene in the movie on the golf course with his brother and one of the few yeah. moments where i think he lets his guard down uh, yeah. a little bit <laughs> i agree and, and i just i think you can relate to it on so many levels because i think a lot of us have Loved ones, whether it's family or friends, not not to this extreme of what of what the lead character is involved in, but uh, we all have 
family members, loved ones who are, for lack of a better term, lost souls. And yeah. we, we try to reach them and we try to communicate with them and guide them. And it just it just doesn't stick. It doesn't stick. And it's frustrating. And that's why it really resonated with me. I think uh, maybe maybe not about bank robbery and trying to avoid <laughs> arrest for murder, but to some extent, someone who's a lost soul who you care about and you just it doesn't yeah. matter what you do. You can't you can't reach them. And, and that's what I thought of when I watched that scene. It was that, yeah. that scene, that scene, and then the final scene with him and his mother, um, J- Jackie Weaver's. We, we were talking about diamonds in the rough and hidden gems to start our, our interview, and maybe because she's not, you know, she didn't get to America, she didn't get here for audiences to start really appreciating her until the last 10, 15 years. But wow, Jackie Weaver is is such an amazing actress. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Matthew, and tell me what it was like directing her. But I want to tell everybody that's watching this or listening to this, that's that's a, a true crime aficionado. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people know about the television show uh, Animal Kingdom, um, but the movie Animal Kingdom uh, with Jackie Weaver, she got a, uh, I believe she got an Oscar nod. She did. Yeah, that's right. That. And uh it's an Australian movie. Uh, there's a number of actors that you'll recognize that have made their way t- into into big United States, you know, Hollywood yeah. blockbuster films. Joel uh, Egerton, Joel Egerton yeah. um, great uh, film. Ben uh, Mendelsohn. But uh, it is an amazing film. It's the same story that you're getting in the TV show, but it's I, I and I know the TV show is a hit, so I'm not trying to. Uh, down talk the TV show, but the movie to me is a is a brilliant so movie, and she gives a, a a tour de force performance. Every time you see her, uh, it, it, she steals scenes. Um, you know, she she was uh, with Brad Cooper in uh, Silver Silver Linings Playbook. Uh, was was great. What was it like getting the getting to work with her? She's an incredible actress. I agree. Um... You know, and also, yeah, she, you're right. She did not become famous in America until like 15 years ago, but she's been around forever. You know, the 1970s, she's in some of my favorite Australian films, um, two of which I'll, I'll rename here and recommend. Picnic at Hanging Rock, great fucking movie. Peter Weir film, um, kind of a thriller. It's, 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 she's very young in it and she's amazing. Um, and she's also in this great film called Stork, which is like a cult, Australian cult classic. So she's been, but she's been around forever. Theater, film, all that. And, you know, she's somebody who, yeah, she's been doing this for like 50 something years. Um, she was the coolest. I mean, one of the easiest people in the world to work with. Um, you know, you would not think you were talking to someone who's been nominated for two Oscars. She was very unassuming, um, you know, very cool, very funny, you know, would make funny jokes and, and things. She made fun of uh, some of my dialogue for having the words actually, really, and truly in it a lot. And we were laughing the whole day. Um, you know, I mean, her seeing you, she, we only had one day with her. Cause this was, this movie was made on a pretty tight budget. I can't say what the budget was, but it was tight. Um, less than it looks is what I say. And, um, you know, we were, we were, you know, we had to be creative and, and certainly, you know, with her, someone of her caliber, we only had one day to shoot all of her scenes, which is quite a lot. You know, her, her main scene is like eight, eight pages long. So, you know, we had, it was a, you know, it, it looked like it was going to be a really hectic day. The truth is it wasn't because her and Tom, when they played their big scene together and her and Chantel too, both scenes, I think came out really nicely, but her and Tom, like when that scene went up on its feet, I thought it was going to have to be all this work, all these camera angles. And once it played, it just worked so well because the two of them were so good that all I really had to do as a director was set the shot up right and get out of their way. You know, I didn't have to give, I didn't like, you know, I got to say, you don't really direct Jackie Weaver. <laughs> you know, if she asks you for something, you help her. You know, if she needs, if she wants information, you give it to her. But like, you know, Jackie, any, and, and the same with all these guys, honestly, Tom Pelfrey, Ryan Phillippe, you know, I mean, these are people who've been, been doing it for such a long time. And they're so good and they're so seasoned and they've worked with so many great directors. You know, I mean, Jackie, as you point out, it's David Meachot, David O. Russell, and like, you know, Constantly's on Taylor Sheridan with with Yellowstone. I mean, she's worked with real heavy hitters. So, you know, I found that she was really easy to work with, very, you know, reverent, you know, very reverential to the director, which I found funny and, you know, just really cool and fun. And, uh, you know, I consider her a friend now. Like, we got lunch with her recently. And she's just a great, great person, great actress, um, very funny, very cool and even keeled. And, you know, 
any director out there with a movie, if you have a role for her, get her because she's the best. I never thought we were going to get her, by the way. I, uh, in fact, I'll tell you a funny story. I was developing the script in 2019. I remember I, the script was optioned by these two companies that produced the film, Trailing Picture Show, GG Films. And we were doing rewrites and uh, I was taking, I was getting my first round of notes, you know, becoming a professional writer, getting hazed. And um you know, hazed in the development process, but they were great. But they were, they were pushing me to do better, and I'm really glad they did. But uh, I remember I was doing a pass on that one scene with Jason and his mother, and it was a lot shorter originally. It was like briefer. He kind of comes in, tries to con her, she doesn't work, and he leaves. And the producers were like, "No, no, no, really, like make that role hit because I'm telling you, you can get someone like you can get Jackie Weaver." And I looked at him, I was like, "You guys are fucking crazy." <laughs> I was like, "We're not gonna get Jackie Weaver for this role, no way." And then sure enough, you know, when we went out to cast American Murderer, you know, we cast, we started casting in March of 2020. So not the best time to start casting. The world movies. shut down in the middle of the year. world's shutting the down. Casting. We're trying to make offers. Nobody's getting back to us. This whole thing, it really looked kind of dim. You know, it was like, okay, maybe we'll film this in 2021 if this thing blows over was kind of the thought. But I kind of believed, I was like, you know what, we're going to film this year. I kind of had this like resolve in my own gut where I was like, we're going to shoot this year. I don't care. Let's start storyboarding. Call my cinematographer. I'm like, let's shot list every day. We're filming. You know, it's going to happen. And you kind of have to be that way in film, I find. You don't have to give yourself the green light. You know, you can't really wait on someone to give it to you. And um, I remember, like, you know, then we, like, once Tom joined, though, and then Ryan joined, like, once those two were locked in, once they joined the cast, we got these amazing people to come. And I think a huge part of it was like, yes, they liked the script enough to take a chance on a first time director, you know, but I think people were hungry to work, you know, Jackie Weaver, I think wanted to do something fun, you know, and like, this was a fun role for her. And I think same with Adina or same with you know, Paul Schneider, or Chantel Van Sands or Kevin Corrigan, you know, I think a lot of people were coming. And this is also the same for the crew, by the way, a lot of the Utah crew that filmed this movie were you know, we were all coming out from a time of we were locked up in our apartments or houses and we wanted to get to work and do something. And so that we got, you know, cause we shot the movie in December, 2020. So, you know, roughly in that time. So you think about when that was, it was a time when the world was in lockdown pre-vaccine COVID. And, uh, you know, we were just lucky to be getting to do this period, you know? And I think that was part of the fun of this cast, you know, and how it was able to come together. Cause I think if we filmed any other time, maybe we would have gotten one or two of these people but that the odds that all of them would have been available at that time i think came down to you know the time that it was did you did you cast tom based on ozark i, I did mean, not, not, no, not no. i'm not saying like just but was that something that really uh opened well, your eyes and be like wow this guy no absolutely man absolutely i mean well i i'll tell you what happened i was so back to march 2020 where we have lists right Tom was not on, on the list. I didn't, I I found out later I knew who he was, but I didn't at the time yet, you know. And my producer Gia Walsh called me and she goes, Hey Matthew, are, are you watching Ozark? And I said, No, I don't watch TV. I just watch TC. I'm a criterion in old movies. <laughs> and she said, Well, stop being stupid and watch Ozark. Said, okay. So I start watching. And then in the same hour, my brother, who's the composer of the film, and my best friend, who's a talent agent, call me. And they say, hey, are you watching Ozark? Sky Tom Pelfrey is perfect for your movie. So I go, okay, either Gia talked to them or they all are all feeling this, but let me go watch Ozark. So I turn on the show. And, you know, I used, I acted in high school. I, was, I, I took this great acting class at, uh, at a conservatory. And I remember there was this crazy ass teacher I love named Jill. And she used to say to us, <laughs> she would go, now guys, listen, when you audition for a movie or a show, they know in the first five seconds if you're right for the part. And me and my actor friends would laugh at her and be like, this woman's crazy. Like, <laughs> you know, how do you know in five seconds? You need a monologue, you need a scene, you need something. But I learned that Jill was fucking right when I saw Tom in that first episode of Ozark. Because it was like, it was literally like the second he came on screen, it was just so clear that he was the right guy. And part of what it is, I think, that made him pop out, you know, and I wasn't really thinking about it of, oh, is he a leading man or this and that. I was really more thinking, you know, when I saw him, it just hit me. He had all the right traits Jason Derrick Brown needed. You know, Jason Derrick Brown needed to be, for one, he, he has to be charismatic, right? You can't have an uncharismatic guy playing Jason. So he's got to have that. Um, he's got to be physical. 
you know, because it's a physical role. He's doing pull-ups. He's shirtless a lot. He's showing off. He's he's peacocking, right? So you got to have somebody who can do that. Then you got to have somebody who is unpredictable, right? And can switch nodes, can go from, you know, can kind of hit every spectrum of the emotion. Tom very clearly can do that. And so as I watched Ozark, I was like, where have I seen this guy before? And then I realized I had seen Tom in plenty of things. He's been in a lot of plays in New York that I saw, which I'd seen him in. Um, I had seen him in play in, in uh, indie films and TV shows like Banshee, um, you know, where he was also excellent, by the way, and played a really complex character um, on that show. So I'd seen this guy as being someone who was like, wow, he was really interesting. And that ultimately, it just, it became very clear pretty quickly. He was the right, he was, he was the right guy for this. And then when I was filming, I realized to myself, he was the only guy who could have done this. I don't really, I really genuinely don't think there's another actor who could have pulled this role off, you know, and all. And I had a lot of great guys on lists, but no, Tom Pelfrey was absolutely meant to, to Jason Derrick. I don't think there was any accident that he was cast. I like how uh, Ryan's uh, role too is um, in this case, it actually is one dimensional, but I like it because it reminds me of, as, as you know, Matthew, I, I mentioned off camera that I, I teach a course on crime and film and we, we talk about different tropes and things like that. And one of the classic tropes for crime films is the, the G man, the guy yeah. who's, who's just buttoned up straight laced, like yeah. not complicated, just like I just process Intel and I get bad guys. And, um, and I, I, he, it really was like a, a throwback kind of character to, to those kind of G men films. Um, th- is that, is that something you had in mind for his character? Because I think it really plays well. Absolutely. You know, there's many ways to describe Ryan's character. Um, you know, I, I've heard some people say in a, in a way he, he functions as both. Yes. He's the man hunter, right. He's on the guy's tail. He's simple, right. He's got a mission. That's it. It's an understated role. It's, you know, Ryan, one thing Ryan said to me when he read the script and told me he wanted to do it was, he said, the part of the reason I want to do this is I'm just, I'm so glad you didn't do any of those like tropes where it's like, you know, his wife is like, why are you still working on this case? <laughs> you don't understand. Yeah. You know, we didn't do yeah. any of that BS. Yeah. We really, like, you know, we kept, it's a minimalist role. And I think Ryan does a really good job at it because, you know, he, he, he's very, you know, I think Ryan is a very subtle actor actually. And I think, I think a lot of his work, um, I think Ryan is able to do a little, like by just doing a little bit, he can give you a lot. And I think he really understood it. I think he was very much, you know, he he saw the character I know as a shark, like just kind of one tracked mind, which I'm kind of like too, actually. There's a one track singular focus kind of guy. And, um, you know, I think he's the straight man in the movie, you know, and, and that that can be a more challenging. You know, I, I mean, you know, I think everyone, I'm really proud of this entire cast. I think they all just did such great jobs with their roles. And I think they all elevated what I had there. Um, but yeah, no, he was, he was exactly, you know, and I've heard people describe him as the man hunter, you know, sometimes, and I even thought of it like he's in, in a way, like kind of like Joe Cotton's character in Citizen Kane, he's kind of that narrator, he's taking you through, you know, he's guiding you through the movie, but, you know, without his character, the film doesn't work or hold up at all because he's ultimately threading you through and taking the audience on the ride. So he's sort of your way in as a viewer, you know, he's, he's how you're going to see this world unfold and all these different perspectives unfold. And, you know, he's kind of kept at a distance from Jason because all he has are memories, images and photographs and videos and recreations. Right. And so that's kind of what, you know, that's what his his character function serves. But I had such an extraordinary time working with him. Um, He's such a pro. And the first day when he got there, like we were chatting, he was telling me stories of working with Tony Scott, Clint Eastwood, Robert Altman. I mean, he's such a uh, he has such a cool career and. Actor, like I didn't even know. See, he, he's the reason Gosford Park, Robert Altman's one of Robert Altman's last films got financed. You know, it's just like he, he's just he's had such an interesting career and has worked with so many great filmmakers and he's done consistently so much good work. Um, I'm a huge, huge Ryan Phillippe fan. He was really fun to work with. And, uh, yeah, I, I like in the film also his the the kind of dynamic where when he's talking to Adina Menzel's character or or the the siblings you know he has this kind of um well you couldn't you couldn't figure out your brother is a or this this guy you're dating he's a piece of shit and he, and he does all this he he's a con man he robs banks but it that's easy from his perspective because he doesn't even know who this guy is 
until he sees a dead body and surveillance footage of him of him running away. So he's got this tunnel vision, as you say, like this is yeah. a bad guy. He did something really bad. And I like the kind of um, the uh, just the contrast when he's he's playing that straight man. And and I, I almost felt a little bit of sympathy for the, the other characters when they're like, it's easy for you to say because this is your first and only exposure to this guy. But for these other people, it's a much more complicated relationship. And, and you can tell they're struggling with it. They don't they don't want to they don't condone the bad things he's doing. Uh, right. they, they are wrestling with this. But, uh, you know, he, he his thing is time is of the essence. We got to get this guy laser focused. But. The, the other people are just trying to process this all. And it was just, it was just a f- lot of tension and it was fun to watch, uh, watch the different actors play that, play that off of each other. Jim, I think Jimmy yeah. can attest to this. And, and I'm interested in, in Matthew's response that both Jimmy and I, we've been around because of our career and our research path. Uh, we've been around a lot of G men, you know, guys that were very, high end law enforcement, elite law enforcement, whether it be FBI, DEA, um, IRS, ATS, we could go through right. the alphabet soup. <laughs> and I'll tell you th- that the way that Ryan played the character, his character's name is Lance. I'm, ass- uh, I'm assuming that was a composite. No, he's actually a real guy. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I see he's wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that this is how most of these guys are. And I'm not yeah. trying to unfairly paint a brush over uh, all uh, um, crime busters, but there's a certain personality yeah. uh, and, and a, 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 a singular focus and a, an obsessive, almost, you know, OCD type personality yeah. that, and it, and it's, 90% of these type of guys that I've met fit that profile. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, cause they live, look, they live the job, they live the job 24 seven. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and look, you know, we, we never, I never spoke to the real Lance. There are interviews with him that I watched and kind of, you know, to get a sense of what his wardrobe was like and as deep, you know, as much detail as I could, but you know, we, yeah, we wanted, we were striving to be as authentic as possible. Not necessarily as accurate, as possible you know there's a lot of th- there are things we change to dramatize this movie i should be clear about that you know in case of anyone who's portraying the film is listening and angry at me you know this was this, this is a work of true crime fiction you know I, I i dramatize things i made things up to make things more exciting and compelling for an audience but we you know there was a lot of research that was done and you know there were a lot of facts that i did use and maybe like twist to kind of like you know make the story to to inspire certain scenes and events but, um, you know, yeah, I mean, we wanted to be as authentic as possible. And, you know, I think that's part of why Ryan really responded to this, you know, in the, in the way his character was portrayed. Because he said to him, and Ryan's played a lot of Jeanette, you know, he's played a lot of cops, he's played a lot of agents. So, you know, he's, he's done this type of role before, and he said it felt very honest to him as well. So I'm glad you said that. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I like him as a police officer in, in Crash. Uh, yeah, he's getting that. He's Oscar winning film and he plays kind of a the young uh doe-eyed yeah. uh cop that's going out with the the seasoned cop and he realizes very quickly that uh he's that, also that, great in the police that police officers sometimes uh don't always walk the straight and narrow and, and Matt Dillon was great in that role. Uh, yeah. got a no- nominated for for an academy Award. and he and he plays a great prick too uh, you know I, like i look at uh you look back at cruel attentions and, oh yeah. You know, yeah that was that was the sleepover movie when i was growing up or the party <laughs> you know that they would put on at a party and like i know what you did school. last summer i i this is what i am such a nerd that i can yeah. remember his character name in that movie his character's name was barry cox was it yeah <laughs> no, he, he plays a great yeah no he can really he's got range i mean he could play he plays a great prick but he also plays a great you know, lawman and you know, he's from a military his family has military background so he know he actually knew the right way to hold the gun and everything i had someone in a screening the other day said i was so glad your movie he was holding the gun the right way because every other crime movie that you know that cops actually hold a gun like or fbi yeah. just supposed to look like this not like in the movies it's always like that always but they actually hold it at first like that until they're ready to draw and so and he knew that that was i didn't tell him to do that i actually was kind of like why are you holding the gun like that he's like that's how we hold guns dude <laughs> you know <laughs> so 
I was really, this yeah. Was a, this was a lot of fun. You know, I, I want to, you know, wrap up uh, in the next, yeah. you know, let's say five minutes or so, but let's uh, do a little rapid fire with, with Matthew, uh, me and Jimmy, just maybe throw Love some. Um, so, you know, give me your right now, like I, I, I'm not going to say top five or top 10, but when you say, uh, you've mentioned a couple of them already, but directors that have inspired you over your career through the, through the eras, maybe just, you know, name a handful of them. Uh, that I can do easily. Um, favorite filmmaker of all time is Akira Kurosawa. Um, that's my all-time favorite director. Uh, number two would be David Lean. Um, Lawrence of Arabia is my all-time favorite movie, so i got to go with that. Um, have to drop Francis Ford Coppola. I actually got to meet him this year at the world premiere of this movie. Oh, that's uh, he amazing. Was, he was at the we world premiered in Sicily at the Terramita Film Fest, and he was there showing the 50th anniversary of the godfather um wow. so that's a, that's a film that uh and you know so certainly yeah coppola is up there for me he was also the coolest uh i talked to him for like half an hour and he his brain is an encyclopedia like, wow he's, that is, he's, he's, a, he's a real cinephile oh uh, and music person you know my brother did the score for this film and first he asked me about curse Kuros- i asked him about kurosawa what kurosawa was like they were friends and then he, we started going you know kurosawa made like 30 fucking movies and and uh, Coppola has, of course, seen all of them. I've seen most of them. And he's going one for one with me. He's like, have you seen this one? Have you seen that one? Have you seen this one? Have you seen that one? We get like 15 in. And then finally, at the 15th movie, I don't know which one he's talking about anymore. And I'm like, do I lie or do I tell him the truth? I told him the truth. <laughs> I told him the truth. And he said, go watch this. Uh, go watch it. You'll love it. Um, he's very nice, very warm. And then he did the same with my brother with music. He could, he knew more about music than he did about film. It was kind of crazy. So just, yeah, you could see a genius mind there. So anyways, Coppola um scorsese of course i mean i don't you know it's cliche to say him but he's i think the goat the living goat um Sidney lumet um yeah i was know, gonna say so we, we talked about dog day afternoon uh yeah. as as kind of the movie that that sparked this 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 interest in filmmaking and storytelling and you know in interweaving crime as a major uh, factor yeah. in that lumet to me is it, it when you go pound for pound, and in, you know his entire catalog, uh, he, you put it. You can put him up with with the all time greats. Oh yeah, um, no, I I wholly agree. And he did such a variety of movies, you know. Right. Um, now, like the before the devil knows you're dead is, is I think a phenomenal film. You know, which yes. was his last. I mean, he because I he did it for so long. You know, and he did so many different kinds of films. Yeah, so Lumet would be up there for me. So yeah, you know what I was, I was, I was just, I was just, <laughs> sorry, did to digress, but I want to re- reference this. My father and I uh, were just watching an old Lumet movie that that's really, talk, we're talking about hidden gems and things that fall through the cracks. Um, Which but one? That night, night Falls on Manhattan from night. Oh yeah. Oh Andy yeah. Garcia, I love, Jimmy I love that movie. Jimmy Gandolfini right before Tony yes. Soprano. Uh, Dominic Chianese, uh Junior uh, Junior uh, Soprano is, is in the yeah. movie. Um, yeah, so yeah, the, another yeah, kind of great, classic. Great New York corruption, gangsters, cops. He made a lot of films that were under it too. You know, another movie of his I love. I love that one, and I love Prince of the City. That's oh, wonderful. Prince of the City is amazing. Such a, but also like kind of like a hit. Like I remember I had to find that movie. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, I could talk Blue Metal all day. You know, he is, and if there's any aspiring filmmakers listening, he wrote hands down the best book on movie directing. His book, Making Movies, is a must read for any filmmaker. That that book will just inspire you. And, you know, kind of what they say on writing by Stephen King is for writers. I think Making Movies by Cindy Lumet is for directors. He really just like broke down his whole process and how he shoots and blocks and works with actors. Um, and there's tidbits in there that saved my ass on set. Like you know, ask, like asking actors if they want another take. That's a good one. Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge fan of of uh, movies from the 1970s, as you mentioned. Uh, so many great crime thrillers that inspired uh, directors in the years to come. But you know, trying to you know, twisting it a little bit. What would you say? I mean, there, we've there's so much to talk about with with those movies, those great movies from the, the late 60s, 70s, 80s. But what would you say since the year 2000, um, in the last 20, 20 years, 22 years, what would you say are the best crime, crime. thrillers or true crime movies that 
and as an adult maybe that you've really gravitated towards this one's not true crime but i loved uncut gems uh the safety brothers uncut movie. gems the safety brothers and I, Adam thought, I thought they don't need my input, but i thought it was phenomenal i thought, was, I thought that was my favorite movie of that year the guy um, that played the, the guy that I have no idea what his name is, but the guy that played the the gangster in that movie, um, I don't know why I have not seen him in more movies since then. I, I, that guy well, they cast casting. Yeah, they cast a lot of real like non actors in the, their yeah. movies. So yeah, Uncut Gems I thought was excellent. Um, you know, a really great one that's kind of not a, a little not hit, uh, not seen as my hidden gem is uh, an Indian film called Gangs of Wasaypur um it's a it's in two parts it's two two two-hour movies and it span it's a it is based on a true gang in mumbai i think and it spans a family an indian crime family over the course of like 50 years and it's awesome it's fucking crazy and wild like it's you know done in a really cool style like they literally have like it's like peck and paw tony scott like it's got like these shooting scenes where like they're fucking firing machine guns to dubstep it's wild but I learned about the ones. I think there was an article where Scorsese talked about it. Another great Indian uh, crime film, Company, uh, great movie. Um, Macbool, which is an t- Indian take on Macbeth, also Indian gangster films. I re- in the recent like last twenty years, I really, I really love. Um, and you know, of course, Scorsese is still. I mean, I love The Irishman. I thought it was excellent. I love. Uh, <laughs> we I can do a whole other episode on that. Well, I, I'm stepping away from the. The drama, uh, in terms of the the acting was great, directing was great, writing was great. You know, Jimmy and I, I don't want to speak for Jimmy, but we have some problems with the history in that movie and and no. how it espouses to kind of be the uh, the gospel when it comes to Jimmy Hoffa. And I I wish people would just take that as great movie. Scorsese's brilliant, Pacino, Pesci, De Niro, all brilliant, but I. It doesn't sit well with me that really the majority of the world right now, because it was coming from De Niro and, and Scorsese, now believe that that's what happened with, with Jimmy Hoffman. It's right. Could not be further from the truth. Right. Right. But yeah, that's no, a whole other yeah. podcast. Yeah, no, I hear I hear you. I, I wanted to ask uh, Matthew, I know we're we're getting short on time, but um about as you've mentioned other kind of genres and you, and you can see as you've pointed out i have this shrine to to crime films behind me but my first love as uh, maybe others know listening i've mentioned it before my first loves are are horror and science fiction and you already sort of tipped your hand a little bit in this episode talking about a monster movie and there's a scene in the movie i i don't want to uh spoil it because it's a very jarring scene but it's where tom's character is is, is having some post-traumatic stress and um there's some really jarring scenes where right away I'm like, Oh, this is, this is turning into a horror film. And Matthew, I'm sure you know what scenes I'm talking about. Yeah. Was that, was that, was that an influence? Uh, because there's those moments where it seemed to me like you were, you were drawing in at least briefly some, some a type of it's, horror. And I got some American psycho vibes there too. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I do love horror. Um, it's not the genre I'm the most knowledgeable on, but I do love it. Um, you know, and certainly like, there's a great, I was actually, for that scene you're talking about, also, I was influenced by uh, Throne of Blood, Kurosawa film. That's a take, also a take on Macbeth. And, you know, Macbeth, I think, has a similar storyline to American yeah, Murder. Haunted. In a way, where, yeah. you know, he's haunted by his past. So, you know, I was looking at that. Um, you know, I didn't, for that scene, I didn't look at too many horror films in particular, but I do, I do love horror. I love Japanese horror, especially Onibaba. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but awesome movie. Um, you know, I just saw the film Pearl uh, by Ty West. I thought it was fucking great. Um, I, it really. I haven't really seen it out. yet. It's I fun. It yet. It's weird. It's one of the weirdest tones I've ever seen in a movie, but um, I thought it was pretty spectacular. I was, I watched, I was really uh, surprised by it. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is how to pronounce it, but I watched, uh, uh, is it Quidon? uh 1964 film uh it's a toho film um Mm -hmm. and it's really creepy uh really and i I love i'm a big kaiju film fan i love godzilla movies and things like that but um so it's the same studio but it's a very different kind of film it's not like science fiction you know giant it's a ghost story yeah ghost story it's very it's very uh haunting creepy type of film yeah that film that that was a classic yeah yes Uh, no so just to wind up one last question 
Uh, if you know, you could tell our listeners, our viewers, uh, one movie that you've seen in the last year um, that people would really appreciate and and enjoy. There's a lot of content out there. Right. Uh, it, it's the gift and the curse because there's so much, but then you got to kind of curate through that content to to figure mm-hmm. out what, what's the best to consume. What 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 have you what have Can you consumed? Be- in the last it, year that really blew your sock or uh, blew you away, knocked your sock. And it, it doesn't have to be a movie made this year. It can just be any film no, yeah. out there. Um, you know what I just saw recently? I'd never seen. took me a long time. It's a film classic. Uh, it's a movie called Peeping Tom by Michael Powell. Yeah. Um, I had never, somehow this movie escaped me. I love the director and I love a lot of his film. Michael Powell was a great British filmmaker, did films with Emmerich Pressburger, and they did a bunch of classics like The Red Shoes and Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. But this movie, Peeping Tom, he made by himself, and uh, he made it in 1960. And the movie completely <laughs> freaked everyone out. The critics panned it when it came out. It, it was like he was vilified. It ruined his career, basically, and made him stop directing. But it's such it, it gained cult classic status and became known as one of the best movies ever made. You know, Scorsese's talked about it a lot. Other film scholars have, have noticed it. it's it's a really cool horror film but it's actually what i love about it and i think pearl the other movie i just mentioned that came out there was kind of like this too was bloodier than pete and tom but um because for me the best horror is psychological um you know and scary just being in someone's mind and peeping tom is a really great film because it puts you in this killer's brain and it makes you so uncomfortable and on the edge of your seat um so if you're looking for a horror movie that's not too scary like my my girlfriend can't handle she she couldn't sleep after parasite for three weeks <laughs> um, but you know, like she, she's very like not into horror, but she watched Peeping Tom with me and she, she loved it, you know, because again, it's all about the psychology and that's more interesting, I think. So I would advocate for, yeah, check out Peeping Tom, uh, check anything out you've, anything you've check seen out like Pearl. In, the last, in the last year, like more recent stuff. That you've no, no, I mean, the Peeping Tom, I saw this past year, but you know, um, I mean, I mean, anything that's been made, let's say, post uh, well, Pearl, Pearl definitely, um, was excellent. Um, I shouldn't say made post pandemic, released post pandemic. Um, yeah, Pearl was Pearl was really excellent. Um, I really enjoyed Tar, the Kate Blanchett. I thought that was a really, really interesting movie. Uh, she, a great performance from her. So I think that's out right now too, so people can see it. So do you think um, Pearl is better than X? Because Pearl is the prequel. I haven't seen X. Um, oh, interesting. So you're gonna watch it chronologically then actually. The yeah, I went into I went into X totally completely blind okay. um so i had no idea what i was getting to i'm trying to what was the oh i love nightmare alley the guillermo del toros i got version. i've seen the original i have not seen the one with bradley cooper i got to i've heard the like original is great too to the box office but i've heard it's really good the original is great too it, it they're very different you know it's very different takes on the same story kind of like infernal affairs and the departed you know it's oh yeah like, yeah you, you can get a great watch out of both um, and appreciate different things about it. But um, I thought Del Toro did a masterful job. I think the movie's criminally underrated. Um, well, this was, this was, this yeah. was, sorry, no, sorry. If you have more, tell us. I didn't want to um, tell yeah, no, those are, so I'll say Nightmare Alley, Pearl, and Peeping Tom. So I'll give you a, a mixture. Yeah, if I can just say uh, for Peeping Tom, I, I, I'm sorry to turn this into one of my lectures, but we talk about that in my crime and film class because Peeping Tom comes out around the same time as Psycho. Yeah. And these are, these are both very important in terms of a shift in filmmaking from uh, more science fiction, supernatural horror to reality-based horror. Right. <laughs> because up until that point, most horror films, not all, but most were either aliens, vampires, <laughs> sorcery, something like that, ghost. And uh, Psycho and Peeping Tom really signified a trend toward uh, what we would see more in the 70s and 80s, which was uh, uh, slasher films and uh, uh, more reality based horror. So I I, I agree with you. Great film and an important film just in terms of the history of cinema. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on. This was we want we really want to make OG podcast, not just a place where people can you know, get their true crime fix and their mob fix or their biker fix, um, drug dealing fix. <laughs> uh, but we want to make it a place where where true crime storytellers can come and and engage and promote and we can geek out with them like we are with you yeah. uh, for, for, for filmmaking and, and storytelling. So 
this was a, a great way for us to kind of maybe kick off that new new chapter in 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 an OG uh uh you know a, a new a new way for OG to 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 produce uh podcasts and and our our Zoom content will be kind of complementary to some of our other stuff. So thank you so much for for helping us tip it all off. Yeah, and where, um, where can they, where can we like our audience find out more about you and your films and, you know, for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys so much uh, for having me on. This was so fun. And this, this podcast was made for me. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I made this movie for you guys and your fans um, and, and people who are into true crime and true crime stories. Um, yes. Please uh, follow me on Instagram at Matthew L Gentile. Um, and you can follow me on my website at Matthew Gentile director.com. I have to update it, but I do update it pretty frequently. And you can also write me there. I, I, I get the email from there. Um, may take the time to respond, but I do. And um, the other, as, as far as seeing American Murder goes, you can see American Murder right now in theaters. Um, you can check on Showtimes or Fandango to see where it's playing. It's playing in the city near you. Um, and it's now, as of Friday, October 28th, going to be available on all digital platforms. So anywhere you rent a movie, iTunes Store, Amazon, uh you know any of them you can rent the film cable um and please come see it please check out american murder and if you like it please review it on imdb please review it on rotten tomatoes please review it on letterbox wherever you review movies because a movie like this uh is an indie film it's a labor of love just like this podcast i know is a labor of love you know labors of love are great they fulfill us but we need support so please support this i'm gonna go wait you guys original gangsters five out of five on apple and everything um, Thank and you. please, please, fans of the film and fans of the podcast, go rank the film and, and recommend it to your friends um, if you like it. Um, and if you don't, just stay quiet. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, man. Guys, thank you so much. This was such a blast. Um, I had such a great time talking to you about crime and gangsters and movies we all love. And uh, you, you've got me for any of my films. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Matthew. Much. We'll stay in you touch. Never know where, yeah, you never know where things can evolve to. Uh, you know, uh, we'd love to have conversations about you know anything in the future, any type of collaborations, and and we endorse Matthew Gentile and and everything he puts out. Uh, he's a true, true rising star in the industry. You need to know about him. You need to know about his film. Um, and I and I know it's just the the tip of the iceberg in terms of where his career is going to go. He's, he's younger than Jimmy. I mean, he, we, Jimmy and I got up more than a decade on him and uh, <laughs> I, I can tell that this is the next uh, couple decades for Mr. Gentile are, are going to be bright and we're going to be a lot, a lot of movies. And, and I, and I, we hope that we will see you on the red carpet at the Oscars one day. Hell yeah. So. <laughs> Let's get there. Let's get there. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. All right. So for, uh, for Ben behind the glass, Matthew, thank you so much. Scott Bernstein, uh, Jimmy Bucciolato, we will be back next week on the OG Podcast. We're out. <laughs>